He killed his first family in a jealous rage, and then he was luckily able to get another chance. But after that, he killed his second family. This is the harrowing case of Gregory Green. Hello, friend, and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also dishwashing. I'm actually a professional. But today, we're going to go over the case of Gregory Green and the atrocity that is his life. You're going to learn about why he should have never had one family, let alone two, and how the justice system failed. Wow, it failed? Shocker. For our story today, we're heading over to Wayne County, Michigan. With a population of around 1.8 million people, it's the most populated city in the state. It was the sixth county in the Northwest Territory, and it was formed on August 15th of 1796. If you ever find yourself here, you could visit the Henry Ford Museum and see some very interesting cars. Or you could go to the Fox Theater and see an opera that you'd probably never seen before. You could even go to one of the beautiful parks in the area and have a picnic. But a picnic is definitely not why we're in town today. Gregory, or Greg Green, was born on December 10th of 1966 to his mother Tommy Lee Green, and I'm not sure who his father was. Not much information is out there or known about him, but he does have some siblings and appeared to have a relatively good life. His family was religious and they all went to church and that's about all I know. I'm not sure if he had any problems growing up or if he was bullied or anything like that, but he definitely ended up turning into something awful. In his early 20s, he met a woman named Tanya Clayton Green, and they got married shortly after. She had two children from a previous relationship, and they were going to be involved as well. Good news came in 1991 when Tanya found out that she was pregnant, but within about six months, Greg started to change. Something either happened to him, or he was just a horrible person. I'm going to go with the second option. He started to become very jealous, controlling, and extremely violent with Tanya. She actually called one of her friends and said that Greg was acting different and that she didn't know if he was on or something, but one day he just switched and he was changed. So Tanya finally had enough and she decided that she was going to leave him. Her plan was to go to church and pray and then she was gonna go back home, pack her bags, and leave. She went to church and when she got home, Greg was there waiting for her, and he was furious. He must have sensed that she was leaving, or she said something about it. I'm not too entirely sure. Greg then stabbed her numerous times and killed her and their unborn child. While this was all going on, Tanya's children were supposedly hiding in the closet. How incredibly sad. I'm glad that he didn't do anything to them, however. But after this happened, Greg called 911 to report what he just did, and eventually officers would arrive on the scene. He was immediately arrested and then pleaded no contest to second degree murder in 1992. He tried to use the insanity defense and say that he had no control over his actions. So the state gave him a psych evaluation and it was found that he was mentally competent. Greg was then convicted and given a 15 to 25 year sentence. A 15 to 25 year sentence. Are you kidding me? There are people in jail literally right now doing more time than that for the good green. Greg's mother wrote to the judge in 1992 and said, I don't believe Gregory is a threat to society. I don't believe a long sentence will make him any better because he has suffered already and he will continue to suffer the rest of his life. What do you mean? Did she just forget about what he did the year prior and suffer? How is he suffering? While in prison, Greg tried to get out on parole a total of five times. He was denied the first four times, twice in 2004 and twice in 2006. In 2004, the parole board said they felt like Greg demonstrated little emotion or remorse and had a lack of empathy. Greg also started blaming Tanya for her death and said that it was all her fault. By late 2006, however, Greg started blaming his actions on immaturity from the past. That's not immature, that's heinous. He was really trying his hardest to get out, 
and he also had a pretty big support system backing him. His sister Deidre Broders wrote on November 22nd of 2006 that over the years, Greg has become closer to the Lord and reads his word daily. I believe this is what has helped Greg through this difficult and trying time. One of Greg's biggest supporters was a pastor from Detroit named Fred Harris. Fred was an old friend of Greg's and was helping him to try and get out and find the Lord. He wrote to the Michigan Parole Board on August 17th of 2005 and said, Dear Blank, this is a letter of support for Mr. Gregory Green. Gregory and I were friends before his mishap and he was incarcerated. He was a member of our church. I am offering the help of the church as well as myself in any way we can be of service to Gregory. I feel he has paid for his unfortunate lack of self-control and the damage he has caused as much as possible and is sorry. This will not restore the lives that were taken. He will carry that with him for the rest of his life. We are hoping to assist Gregory in now giving to life and helping those in need through our church work in the USA as well in other countries. Hopefully this can pay back a portion of that which was taken. If there are any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Signed, Apostle Fred Harris. God bless. Then on November 27th of 2006, he wrote to the board again, this time saying, Dear Parole Board, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm writing this letter in support of Gregory Green. I understand he is being considered for parole. Gregory was attending our church before he was sentenced to prison. He was very faithful attendance-wise, showed a great interest in the Lord, and was very helpful. Over the years, we and some of our members have communicated with Gregory, I through visits as well as letters occasionally, and others through mail. Our ministry deals with correcting behavior problems by understanding their origin, how we have been affected by them, and what we must do to change them, this procedure is called inner healing and deliverance. With this technique in mind, while interacting with Gregory, I've noticed a great deal of growth and his understanding has matured quite a bit as well as his processing skills. If he was to be released, he would be welcomed as part of our church community and whatever we could do to help him adjust, we would. Signed, Apostle Fred Harris. This would be something Fred would later come to regret and he also has a daughter that comes into play very shortly. Greg was considered a model prisoner. He kept his head down and he followed the rules. While he was incarcerated, he only had one minor fight and didn't get involved with any violence and didn't argue with any authority. So in 2008, after serving only 16 years for murdering his pregnant wife, Gregory Green was released on parole. His parole only lasted about two years and in this time period, he had to check in with an officer and that's about it. He moved in with his mom and stayed quiet the entire time and didn't have any hiccups. So after the two years passed, his parole was up and he was a free man. 18 years after committing such a horrible act, he was considered completely free. How on earth did this happen? This is so frustrating. Remember how I said that Pastor Fred has a daughter that comes into play? Well, her name was Faith Harris, and she too, like Fred, believed that Greg was a changed man. She had previously been in a relationship with a man named Chadney Allen Sr. and together they had two children, a boy named Chadney Allen Jr. and a girl named Kiara Allen. Eventually, her and Greg got together very shortly after he was done with parole and they almost immediately got married in December of 2010. Within about two years, they would have two more children, both girls named Koi and Kaylee. Everything genuinely seemed okay. Greg's old tendencies basically vanished, but about three years into the marriage in 2013, things changed. Greg started to become enraged and violent. It's like out of the blue, he just became controlling and jealous over Faith. So she finally had enough and went and filed a restraining order against him. And in the application, she said, we're filing for a divorce. He's being belligerent, kicking things. He kicked the couch while the baby was sleeping on it, just kicking things, threatening me and saying, if I don't leave, things are going to get ugly. Jumped at me like he was going to attack. This went on for hours. This restraining order was denied on the grounds of insufficient evidence. Are you kidding me? Just look at this guy's past. What more evidence could they need? In late 2013, Faith ended up filing for a divorce, but the paperwork never went through. I'm not too sure what happened here, but I'm guessing that Greg promised that he would change. Obviously he didn't, 
And so about three years later, in August of 2016, Faith filed for a divorce yet again. This was the third time. And then one month later, on September 21st, Greg would do the unthinkable. During the middle of the night, he taped a plastic tube to the exhaust of his car and poisoned his two youngest children, five-year-old Coy and four-year-old Kaylee. He did this by using a hose that ran from the tailpipe of his car to their bedroom. After this, he woke Faith up and bound her with duct tape and zip ties and tied her to a chair in the basement. He shot her in the foot and slashed her face with a box cutter, but she was still alive. Greg then brought Faith's children, 19-year-old Chadney and 17-year-old Kiara, into the basement. He shot them both execution style while Faith watched. Finally, around 1.15 in the morning on September 22nd, Greg called 911 and waited for them in his driveway. Basically the exact same thing as he did in his previous marriage. The first responders arrived to an incredibly gruesome scene and they immediately arrested Greg and they took Faith to a hospital where she would eventually recover from her injuries. So let's think about this for a second, right? Fred Harris, the pastor who was trying very hard to get Greg out, also the father of Faith, somehow managed to intertwine these two together. Within doing so, he ended up losing four grandchildren and sadly gained nothing. What I have to say about this is that if someone is willing to do that horrible of a thing in the first place, they're not going to change. It takes a certain type of person to murder someone, let alone stab them numerous times all over. Greg was never going to change and he should have been given life in prison in the first place. Not such a light sentence. I can imagine that Fred probably feels pretty awful about that. In 2017, at 55 years old, Greg went to court and was sentenced to 45 to 100 years in prison by the judge Dana Hathaway. He'll also serve another mandatory two years for a weapons charge. By the time he's eligible for parole, he'll be 97 years old. Personally, I believe it should have been much longer, and actually, I believe a life for a life. His first sentencing was utterly ridiculous and he should have been given life in prison. And I don't know how he wasn't. Quite frankly, I cannot begin to even understand what went wrong in 1991 for him to have been given such a light sentence. It's actually infuriating that he was able to just get out and be on parole for only two years and then just live his life like nothing ever happened. No. Why does it work that way? Before Greg was sentenced, Faith was allowed to speak and some of the things that she said was heartbreaking, but you need to hear it. I'm not happy. I'm not satisfied with the outcome. There's no punishment that fits the crime. Not even torture and death would be justice. Your justice will come when you burn in hell for all eternity for murdering four innocent children, all because you're insecure as a man. Plus the other two lives you took. You are a con artist, you are a monster, you are a devil in disguise. You are now forever exposed. I just want to pause this real quick and say, devil in disguise. I disagree with that part because it wasn't in disguise. It was completely out in the open. I've thought over and over again what I would say, even though it doesn't even matter. First of all, I am not and did not and will not suffer like you intended for me to do. What you tried, what you tried to do didn't work. I am and was a damn great mother to all of my children. I was their mother and father. I'm the one who took out the time with each and each and every one of them. I taught them, excuse me, I taught them how to do things as well as people in my family and friends. Sometimes I dream of the night all this happened and wake up screaming and sweating, thinking that I can save my children somehow. Then I realize that the nightmare is actually reality and my children are really gone, and I try to find the strength to start my day somehow. Other times, there's just crazy nightmares that I wake up from in fear and try to understand them, but I'm told that they all link back to this horrific experience I have had. I can't think of the last time I really rested without medication. I can still feel the zip ties around my wrist, and it triggers horrible memories of that night. There's times I find myself drifting off into thought and then realize I'm not thinking of anything I'm empty. I'm lost, not really knowing what to do with myself, just existing day to day. I miss my children so much that words will never be able to explain. All I ever wanted to be was a mother, a wife, have a happy family, raise my children to be productive members of society, and be happy. The reality I face now is this will never happen for me. Time will never heal this wound. 
I will always be empty. A part of me will always be missing. If the day ever comes when I do wake up and it's not the first thing that I think about, when I look in the mirror, I will always be reminded by the scars he put on my face, cutting me from my ears to my chin with a razor blade box cutter. The pain on the left side of my face never goes away. He cut me so deep that it severed multiple nerves that may never heal correctly. I lost so much blood. I was in critical condition for days. I should have died. Some days I wish I would have. He has scarred me for life. My whole family is devastated emotionally by what has happened. But it has extremely been hard on my parents. They love their grandchildren with all their hearts. Most days, my mother has a hard time getting out of bed and has been in the hospital a few times. But my father is taking it the hardest. <coughs> He's not the same person he once was. The stress has taken a toll on his health. Two weeks ago, he was taken to the hospital because he had a stroke. I honestly don't know where to go from here. I'm numb. There's a hole in my heart and soul that can never be repaired. The loss to me is so big that I will never truly recover for the rest of my life. I will be forever in pain and heartbreak. This wound will never heal. This wound will never heal. I would like to thank the court and you, Your Honor, for the time you have allowed me to speak. I would like to thank the prosecutor's office and staff and all the police officers who helped in this case. In closing, I understand the recommendation of the sentence, but I would like to recommend as a victim myself and the mother of all four murdered children, life in prison without the chance of parole. Thank you. Faith Green. It's terrible to know that Faith had to go through what she had to go through. I can't imagine the pain of losing a child, let alone four, and having to watch it happen right in front of you. I really feel a great deal of sympathy for her, and I hope that she's able to one day find some peace in this world. Chadney Allen Jr., Kiara Allen, and Coy and Kaylee were all very young and had the rest of their lives ahead of them. It's absolutely horrible to think about what they had to endure while they were trapped in that house. I hope that they're all resting peacefully and enjoying the life afterwards. As for Gregory Green, Prison genuinely isn't enough of a sentence for what he's done. He got away with murder the first time and should have never been let out. It's amazing to see how the justice system failed so greatly here and the tragedy it caused. I hope that he rots in that cell and never sees the light of day. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. I also have a second account with my brother named Horrifying where we tell stories about everything paranormal. This includes true crime, mysteries, and things that are just downright spooky. I'd greatly appreciate if you subscribe to that too. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.